Thanks very much for having us here today. Uh, I, uh, I am currently chief data scientist at Intel, where I'm responsible for our big data direction and also making sure that our projects with customers are successful from a big data point of view. That is, that the data science questions that we're asking are uh, appropriate and get good answers. Uh, and then I'm also responsible for communicating our big data vision to the outside world and, and really getting people excited about what you can do with modern data analytics. Um, I come to this path um, starting with a PhD in physics back in the ancient times. I was an astrophysicist working on models of stuff falling into black holes. And uh, following that, uh, I was actually a hedge fund manager for 12 years. So those, those two steps are actually related in the sense that the uh, com computational methods that I developed for my uh, academic work were applicable to forecasting the futures market. So I actually started a company and ran a fund for 12 years. Uh, that was the beginning of big data for me in the sense, of course, nobody called it that back then. But in 1992, we had a two gigabyte database of tick by tick transactions in the futures markets. And for the size of the hardware that we had in those days, that was big data. So I didn't know it at the time, but I was getting on a big data path back in 92. Um, I, following that uh, hedge fund career, I became a product manager for medical devices, uh, particularly ophthalmic diagnostic devices. So I started to learn about healthcare and got very, very excited about working in healthcare. In 2009, when Meaningful Use came out, <clears throat> raise your hand, everyone familiar with Meaningful Use, I hope? Yep, good, 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 okay. Um, meaningful Use came out, the government's incentivizing doctors to use electronic health records. The question is, is the data going to be useful for healthcare? Can healthcare systems improve what they do with the data? And our answer was not, with just EMRs, you needed a system that could take the data from all the different silos, bring it into a normalized, computable environment, and make it possible to actually optimize what you do. So that was what we did with Apixio starting in 2009, and um, where uh, I worked with Vishnu, and uh, Apixio has been developing technology for understanding the clinical record for the past five years and doing some really interesting work. In December, I joined Intel as chief data scientist so that I could just tell the story to a, a broader global audience. Okay, so now that you've had all the excitement of hearing about me, let's find out about you. So raise your hand if you're a software developer. Okay. Got some decent number. Uh, entrepreneurs, very nice, okay. Investors, so some one or two investors in the audience. Uh, healthcare providers, people working in pro de healthcare delivery, okay. And then usually, this is the one that usually has the most hands for me, other. Ta-da, as always, I never know. Okay, so someone who raised your hand for other, tell me what you, what you do. Nonprofit. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Medical informatics. Okay, perfect. So that's fantastic. So what's neat about that is that this is a very broad audience. And so um, we, can, we can talk about a number of things and maybe 
you all can make some connections afterwards. Okay? So you probably saw in the, in the program that we're here to talk about the true state of the patient. So what is that and why are we talking about it? This is a, uh, a framework for thinking about clinical data that we are introducing to the healthcare community and uh, it's, it's the way that we've thought about data at Apixio for a number of years. It's the way I evangelize healthcare data within Intel and outward from Intel to the extent that I can. The true state of the patient is a complete view of all the different elements of what makes up the clinical status of a patient, the genomic status of a patient, the um, behavior of a patient. And so the idea is that it's really a, a 360 degree full way of understanding what's going on with a patient, all their conditions, everything. That sounds trivial in the sense that of course you wanna know that, but it turns out that technically it's actually quite challenging. And when you pull that thread further, you start to see some real analytical value, okay? So we'll talk about what the true state is. We'll talk about how you can determine the true state using big data analytics. And then we'll talk about how that sort of sets the table for the opportunity to use big data analytics in healthcare from here forward. And, and hopefully that's the part of the conversation that we'll get everybody really excited about. So, I'm going to pass it over to Vishnu, and Vishnu can give you some more details on what the true state of the patient is and what comprises it. Yeah. So, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, the true state of the patient. So, what is really the true state of the patient? What sorts of data does it usually comprise of? So, you can think of a patient. Obviously, the face is blurred for HIPAA purposes, and you can think... <laughs> You can think of like what sorts of data go into this true state of the patient, right? Obviously, there's clinical data. All the interpretations, all the labs, all the meds, everything that you would associate with the clinical context obviously goes into determining the true state of the patient, but there's more to it. The other thing that's also important, which is now becoming more and more important, is genomic data. Your genes, annotations on the gene sequencing, Everything that's related to that also goes into the true state of the patient. And third, the most popular one that's happening these days, the Apple Watch, the Basis Watch, the Fitbit Scale, you know, all these sorts of sensor data, telemetry that patients can generate on their own needs to be folded into the true state of the patient. So that is what fundamentally a, a true state of a patient is, right? Combining all data, whether it's clinical, whether it's genomic, whether it's patient-generated, you can even think of other environmental sources of data, like how good is your Dunkin' Donuts membership? So those kind of data. So let's take a deeper dive into each of these important data sources and see what they comprise of. So clinical data, most of you who are familiar with an EHR would think of clinical data as structured data, right? Whether it's like lab results, whether it's uh, claims, 837 claims, or problem lists, or HL7 data, that's some of the clinical data. But a lot of the clinical data is in progress notes, is in textual documentation that physicians write. So a lot of clinical data is in textual data. and even more of it is in scanned documents. This is primarily because not everyone is on an EHR, so there's a lot of data that's on paper charts that needs to be scanned into the system, so these are images in the system. So this is primarily what the composition of clinical data is. Then there's patient-generated data or wearable device data, so most of them look like time series, right, X, Y axis, how much they're moving, accelerations, things like that. So that's kind of what the wearable data looks like. And then there's genomic data. This is just a random sample of the human genome and it's two billion base pairs color coded with one of the bases, right? So that's a lot of data for a small section of the human genome. And in fact, you can even blow this up a little bit further 
and see what's inside each section of the genome. And if you think of like the top row as a genome, that's just expl exploding that specific part, zooming in. You can see there's more detail there. The more you zoom in, the more detail you have about annotating functional components in the genome. So all these three pieces, clinical data, variable device data from your Apple Watch or whatever, and genomic data, even environment data, all these together combine and form the true state of the patient. So we talked about what the true state of the patient is, what it comprises of, but why is it important? What are the use cases that are important around it? So I'm going to hand it over back to Bob so he can talk about that. OK, thanks, Vishnu. So um, obviously, a complete view of the data is, is necessary to understand what's happening. But it turns out that that's actually just getting a, a complete view is, is not trivial. So um, to, to start putting, putting, uh, putting you in context, there was an article a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine in which they looked at documentation for patients who had had a splenectomy. So you get in a car accident, they have to remove your spleen, and there's no doubt, that's a major surgery. That's in your record somewhere. And so, but the question is, um, how is it documented? And so what, what they found at Harvard, looking through uh, a very painful manual process through many, many charts, is that uh, only 29% of those splenectomies are documented in the structured data. The rest of it is in text and scan documents. So it's in the chart, but it's buried. Okay, well, so what? What does that mean in terms of clinical care? Well, it turns out that if you've had a splenectomy, you need to get a new pneumococcus vaccine to prevent you from having sepsis if you get particular common infections. So it's a life-saving vaccination that every uh, uh, splenectomy patient needs to have. So they looked at the rates for vaccination for the different kinds of documentation. And what you see here, if it's not documented in the structured data, you're three times less likely to get that life-saving life -saving vaccination. So the fact that the data is not documented in your structured data means that your clinical decision support can't fire, which means you're not going to get that critical care. So, um, so there, are, there are gaps in the structured data. In fact, we at Apixio did a study in which we uh, looked at seven different major conditions like splenectomy that always impact your care. And we asked, what percentage of the time are those conditions present for a patient but not present in the structured data? So I'm going to do a poll. How many people think that up to 25% of those conditions, those are critical conditions that are in the chart but are not in the structured data. How many of you think it's 0 to 25 percent? Okay, 25 to 50. So we had a couple, a few more. 50 to 75, ah, big number. 75 to 100. Okay, all of you who raised your hand 75 to 100 are probably clinicians. What I've noticed is clinicians always vote high on that one, right? They just expect that the data is not there. They're going to ask all the questions they need because they really don't trust these systems. The answer that we found in our study, and this was across an enterprise EHR, was a little over 63%. So two-thirds of the time, that thing that your doctor needs to know is there, but not in the structured data. Very, very difficult to access. And just to put a fine point on it, here is an actual patient, de-identified, but it's actual patient data, problem list, Got a whole bunch of stuff there, but not hypertension, which is noted in the text. So that should be there. And then down here, I don't know if you can read this, it says, ironically, this is a note from a cardiologist to the primary care provider whose chart we're looking at. You are aware of his acute myocardial infarction four years ago. Not, right? That's, it's, it's, it's tragic. This, this should be here. This should be firing all your, your decision support. It's buried 63% of the time. So the data is missing from the clinical record. So I, I'm going to stop here for a second, and I'm going to just, just talk about how 
how Intel thinks about healthcare data and healthcare technology. And then I'll, I'll get down into a specific example of, of uh, a project that Intel has done. And then I'll hand it back to Vishnu. So Intel is an enabling technology company. We are interested in developing uh, chips for computing that help industry solve problems. And one of the ways we do that is to work with different technology companies, different solution providers, and help them actually solve difficult, challenging problems in a variety of industries, including healthcare, which is one of my big areas of effort. So Intel does a lot of work in the Internet of Things, sensors, wearable data. We're thinking a lot about not only the devices that you wear, but also the devices that capture that data and the devices and the systems in the back end that are doing the analytics on that data. Sorry about that. Um, Intel works very hard to support the open, open source community. It's the number one uh, contributor to Linux and the number three contributor to Spark. Um, the idea is, and this is really my mission as chief data scientist, good analytics should be put in the hands of every business decision maker, regardless of the underlying technology. So the idea is to, is to surface this. And the other, the other area that Intel works very hard at is optimizing computing for gene sequencing and for putting associations between clinical data and genomic data, you know, the annotations that Vishnu was just showing you. Okay, so that's the big context for Intel. One of the projects that we've done not too long ago was to partner with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease. So the background is as many of you know, Parkinson's is a, um, it's a, it's actually a lack of dopamine in the brain. It's a progressive disease in which you get progressive neuromuscular deterioration. <clears throat> the biggest challenge with, my, with uh, Parkinson's in terms of tracking how patients are doing is actually knowing the true state of the patient in the following sense. If I have Parkinson's, I will have periods of increasing and decreasing tremor. I'll have problems with my balance, with my gait. I'll have periods where my sleep is disrupted. I might have intermittent cognitive issues, okay? But then the question is, how, how do I measure that over time? The way they do it now, the clinical standard, is for a, a patient to come into the physician twice a year. The physician does a subjective assessment. On a scale of zero to five, how bad is your tremor? Oh, it's about this much, right? They literally jot down numbers, and that's the system. So given that data, how do you know what the true state of the patient is? Yesterday, I was terrible. Today, I'm fine, OK? So the, the answer for Intel was to instrument these patients. This was a study of 1,000 Parkinson's patients, instrumented with a watch that could measure uh, a number of different factors, including their movement, and track them 24-7, streaming the data to a, data, uh, a, a big data analytics center so that you could actually understand what's happening with the patient. So the, uh, the other nice thing about, about this uh, project is that the, the patients also had an app so that they could enter their own observations so that you could generally generate correlations between the measurements and the patient's observations. At the end of the day, you use big data analytics in this, in this data center to compute what they're doing at each time and then to superimpose on that. So you can see this is wrist data. This is the, the phone in the pocket. By correlating the two, they can figure out are they sitting, are they walking? And then on top of that baseline behavior, they can measure the tremor the balance, the gait, and all of a sudden you've got a quantitative measure 24-7 of what's happening with a patient. You change the treatment and you see how the numbers change. And all of a sudden, because you know the true state of the patient, you know whether a drug is having an effect. And it's a, an absolute game changer for caring for Parkinson's patients, both right now in real time and also for developing effective drugs and treatments which are not always drugs, 
for Parkinson's. So it's a great example of how understanding the true state of the patient through wearables and analyzing the data in a big data analytics platform actually takes you to a new level in healthcare. Vishnu, you want to talk about machine learning? Thank you, Bob. So uh, Bob told us all why knowing the true state of the patient is very important, right? It helps us in a lot of important use cases like managing Parkinson's care. Now, how do you go about actually determining the true state of the patient? And I'm going to talk about some of the work that we at Apixio have done in this regard. So let's start with another problem, right? So we did a study of a, a sample of patients who had heart failure in the problem list. And then we went into their charts and looked at to see if they really had heart failure, right? How many of you think they really had heart failure if you took a this thing? Well, it actually, that's good. It actually turns out that only 70% of them really had heart failure. 30% of the time, the data in their problem list was just plain wrong. And this can happen for multiple reasons. We don't need to go into that. But you still need to make sure that the data you have is actually true, the true part of the true state of the patient. So how do you go about doing it? And this is where you can leverage technologies like machine learning. So for example, if you had the true state of the patient, or some pieces of the true state of the patient, say ejection fraction, and say some other biometric data that you can get from their record, you can put it on a, pl you can put it on a plot like this. This is a very simplified case, but you could still put it on a plot like this, and then try to figure out, try to annotate which ones have no heart failure and which ones have heart failure. And you can use this as training data in a machine learning context to figure out a good separator between what is considered not heart failure and what's considered heart failure. This is basically what machine learning is. F letting the computer automatically figure out this line. That's all it is. So machine learning is one of the critical tools that you start using when you want to identify pieces of the true state of the patient, or if you want to enhance information that you already have, right? So that's one piece. The other piece is when Bob talked about how splenectomy is not completely well documented in the coded data, is that you want to take the coded data, you want to take all the unstructured text data, right? All the progress nodes, all the visit nodes, all the paper charts, and you want to structure it. And this is where technologies like natural language processing and text mining can help you. What you could do is you could let the machine read all those charts automatically and use NLP to figure out important things, like this patient had an EF of 64, right? And this person has heart failure. So that's, that's an other important critical aspect of getting the true state of the patient. So use leveraging technologies like NLP and text mining. And you can obviously extend this out to other sources of data, right? You just don't have to stop with clinical data. You can start with your basic structured data. You can start with your encounter nodes and your uh, lab results. You could augment it with textual data and maybe even image data. And you can even think of non-clinical data and maybe geospatial data, right? What is their community status? Are they unemployed or not? How often they go to a doctor? So you could combine all these sources of data and put it into the true state of a patient. And what might a true state of a patient look like? Well, it obviously have time access because the true state of the patient keeps changing on time. It also incorporates all the data you got from text, whether you, it also incorporates all the genomic data, all the non-clinical data, and you can put it in a computable form. And this is one representation of a computable form, but you could do it in other ways. And that's kind of what we're trying to achieve here. Take all the data you get, take the data from clinical sources, take the data from genomics, take the data from variables, even non-clinical and geospatial data, combine that and put it in a computable form attributed to a patient so that you can compute on it to solve the use cases we talked about earlier. So what can we do if we have the true state of a patient, right? This is more food for thought. This is more things that we could potentially do you could do patient profiling. You could identify exactly what is happening with each patient and figure out what the best course of action is. You could actually do practice-based medicine. It should be medicine, sorry about that. Where if you have a lot of data, you, if you have the true state of the patient across multiple people, you could 
use the data to identify which courses of action work and which courses of action don't work, and then apply that. You could also do personalized healthcare, where instead of taking medications and uh, drugs and courses of action that is specialized to a large cohort, you can do it for an N of one. So these are things you could potentially do if you have the true state of the patient. So and, and I would actually add, yeah. I would add that in fact, some of these are applications that are being done now by both Apixio, by other partners of Intel, by other companies. And so there, there are, this is not all hypothetical. These are, real, these are real solutions that are happening now, but are just the beginning of the big data transformation. So um, Apixio is based on the cloud, right? So Apixio itself is a cloud uh, software provider. And uh, certainly the plants, when they need the large, ex large computational capacity, they can leverage us. And that's kind of what Apixio does. We bring our expertise in big data technologies. We bring our expertise in knowing about all sorts of uh, how, do you do, how do you set up a 100 node cluster on AWS, right? We bring those expertise so that we can, they, plans and provider groups can leverage it uh, for their problems. I'll, I'll add a little bit of Intel perspective on that as well, which is um, uh, one, of the, one of the big elements of what we do at Intel is actually doing proof of concept and lighthouse projects to build reference architectures for customers to actually replicate and um, solve these problems. So for instance, there are um, a number of different published and you know, freely available solutions using big data to, um, to solve some of these problems on the cloud that, uh, that Intel will just you know, help companies, uh, basically point companies to and help them, help them understand how to solve these things. Because you're right, you may not want a thousand uh, servers in your data center, but you may need to leverage a thousand servers for two weeks in a cloud environment. And there are ways, and increasingly it's, it's new technology, but it's, it's no longer bleeding edge. And that becomes an increasingly tangible solution for companies that, that want to be able to make the most of their computing without necessarily having the, the world's largest data center. So that's, that's part of our, it's part of our vision. Thank you. Thank you. Good? All right. Thank you, everybody.